All right, we're going to get started in a few minutes, but since this is the first colloquia of the semester, I want to go over just for those of you that are taking this as part of the special topics in optics course. How many, how many of you are actually doing that in here? Okay. Um, we've enabled D2L on the website. Um, it will have the syllabus. I also have a copy here if you want to see it after um, today's colloquia. Um, it'll detail all of the things on there like the topics for the course and, and the grading and, and so forth um, and, you know, how many of the summaries and, that you have to do. Um, and then that's pretty much it. Uh, if you need me, my office is in 733 or uh, Jason Jones, who's the other co-instructor for this. Uh, yours is on the sixth floor? 625. 625. So, all right. And Jason's going to introduce our speaker for today. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so welcome to our um, colloquium series. Thanks for coming. Um, happy to kick it off today with uh, Professor Linran Fan. Um, he's got his PhD in um, 2017, uh, sorry, 11, uh, from Yale. <laughs> that was right. I'm sorry. I was going back to Peking. I'll step back. He went uh, to Peking University and graduated with the Bachelor of Science in 2011, and then went on and got his PhD uh, at Yale University in 2017. And he did a postdoc uh, at Caltech. Uh, from 2017 to 2018, and now he's joined us here at the College of Optical Sciences. Uh, and he's going to tell us about his work in quantum photon conversion with integrated nonlinear photonics. So thanks, Leonard. Yeah, thanks, Jason, for the introduction. So um, it's my first semester here. As Jason just said, I joined OSC this semester, and I'm actually just going to set up my new lab. So if you want to work with me and if you are interested in my work, so you are very welcome to talk with me, talk about your ideas. That's, that would be wonderful. So uh, today I'm going to talk about basically my PhD work at Yale, quantum photon conversion with integrated nonlinear photonics. So some, first some introductions or some uh, slides for why we need this. So. Uh, Everyone is using nanoelectronics right now, right? You put out your phone, your laptop, there's CPU in it, there's GPU, everything, or microcontrollers, there are nanoelectronics in it. People uh, decrease the size of a computer roughly like this big, the, the, uh, as big as this room to this big, right? So people, people have done a very, very good job in doing silicon electronics. But later people find that Electronics is not very good at uh, high-speed communication, especially over long distance. That's why people are thinking about using light to do that. That's why people de uh, develop silicon photonics. Actually, OIC is very, very strong in this silicon photonics, classical silicon photonics. So for silicon photonics, people have known that uh, there are already commercial products doing this. For example, Intel and IBM, they have this uh, one gigabyte per second silicon photonics transceivers, something like this. And next step further, we want to do quantum photonics. Why do we want to do that? The reason is we want more secure transmission, communication, and also we want more powerful computing. That's why we are thinking, people are thinking about how do we use quantum technology for really some daily applications. Quantum mechanics has been developed for almost a century, more than a century, but how to use quantum technology in daily life, that's still a question mark here. So we don't know. So uh, it can be, actually there are some directions, for example, quantum computing, quantum communications, quantum imaging, quantum sensing, but uh, to, uh, Based on my knowledge, I don't know there is a well-developed commercial product right now. So people are still, this is still a very, very active and uh, cutting edge research topic. In, in order to do this, of course, we need to do something new. Otherwise, this thing uh, can be developed 10 years ago or even half a century ago. So people are trying to look at new materials. And in order to do the quantum photonics, people need to do, develop some new process and also even involve some new physics. So my research, so this is if you go to a quantum optics lab, this will uh, pretty much what you look at in the optics lab, right? Optical table full of all kinds of components. 
you don't want to carry this everywhere, right, in order to use quantum technology. So that's why we want something like this. This is a coin. And we want to build some chip like this. And it can function as well as this whole table. That's my goal. That's my research goal. Of course, we are still far from that. But, but I think we are in a pro, very good progress. We are on our way to achieve this. Actually, this uh, zoom in of that part, actually, I'm working with uh, Professor Sakaguha here, uh, trying to develop a very uh, hybrid uh, quantum nanophotonic chip that can do quantum commu uh, communication. So everything is both small. Small make it convenient. You can carry it everywhere. So I, I, I actually also put a coin here, so you can make a fair comparison, right? This big, this big, and this big, and very small, right? So it's small, it's good. But this is not the only reason. There's a, more, uh, there's a better reason that we want to make things small, a um, uh, reason from physics. Normally, things that are smaller tend to be stronger, for example, the ant. If you are talking about elephant, I don't think any elephant can lift weights like, uh, above his own weight, right? body weight. But for ant, it actually can lift weight as much as three times of its own body weight. And in physics, actually, uh, we are talking about interaction strength. Because if we want to control something, we want to interact with that system first. Then we can influence and control that system. And actually, uh, most of the physics system, the smaller here v is the mode volume, or you can imagine that as size simply. The smaller the size, normally the interaction strength it is. That means more efficient you can control that. So that means we can make things smaller, then get things with higher efficiency, of course, smaller footprint. And actually, when the uh, G, the coupling strength, is strong enough, you will discover some new physics completely different from what you see in a large scale. So I believe these three reasons are better reasons why we want to make things smaller, especially for quantum technology. As you can see, we have a lot of requirements. And also, we want to make things small. So right now, nanoelectronics, they are trying to push towards several nanometer footprint. Uh, current standard uh, CPU may have tens of nanometer footprint, right? So you, as you can see, that's very, very small. Uh, that means the material uh, choice is very limited. Right now, most uh, nanoelectronics or nanophotonics are based on silicon or silicon dioxide or silicon nitride. So these are three standard CMOS materials that you can make very small structures. But here, uh, you can see uh, none of these actually has the second order nonlinearity here. So if we learn about electrodynamics, uh, we know that uh, the linear term is proportional, the polarization is proportional to the electric field. The second term will be proportional to the square. But actually, this is a very important term for quantum technology. Because in order to do uh, quantum communications, you need single photons. Uh, the, a very widely used way to generate single photons right now is based on parametric down conversion. So that conversion efficiency Directly, it's directly proportional to the second order nonlinearity. Another way is that, for example, if you want to convert a quantum uh, state at one wavelength, let's say 1550 at a telecom, uh, the uh, standard telecom wavelength, to visible wavelength, to 775, then you also very likely you need this term to do that. But the problem with current uh, materials here, I show the, the, I show you the crystal structure of silicon, because it has the qubit structure. So it does not have the second order nonlinearity. And also silicon dioxide, silicon nitride, none of them have that. So that's why, actually, I want to work with something else, some new material. So here, I show you aluminum nitride. All my PhD work uh, is uh, focused on aluminum nitride. Aluminum nitride is actually a widely used material for MEMS. Uh, why is that? Because it has very strong piezoelectric effect. Actually, piezoelectric effect is from the second order nonlinearity. Second order nonlinearity. If you look at the crystal structure, you can see it's completely different from uh, uh, from silicon. Silicon has the qubit structure. 
alumni chart that actually has the Uzai structure. And this special crystal structure will give you the desired second order nonlinearity that we want for quantum technology. And with this, we can realize the directly coupling, the direct coupling between optics and microwave through electro optical uh, interaction, and also between mechanics to microwave with piezoelectric effect. And of course, we have the optics, uh, coupling between optics and mechanics with optomechanical interaction. So here I show you the uh, tensor for electro optics and the piezoelectrics. You can see the refractive index has a dependence on electric field. That's the second order uh, effect. And also the strain in the material is also dependent on the electric field inside the material. That's the piezoelectric effect. It's also a second order nonlinear effect. So now, uh, after this, why, after describing why I need alumni nitride, why I need the second order nonlinear, uh, nonlinearity for that. So I'll show you some devices I made during my PhD life. So this one is basically a racetrack. Uh, so you can see, first of all, let's focus on the size. For example, this one, this scale bar is 40 micron. This 160 micron, this 5 micron. Actually, I believe this width is uh, 200 nanometer. This also, this width is 300 nanometer. So this scale bar is 10 micron. So you can see everything is very small. So that's actually uh, go back to the first slides why we want to make things small. Because only with smaller structures, we can have stronger interaction. And for quantum uh, technologies, we basically roughly say we need three parts. We need a source to generate quantum state. And in the middle, we need to control and manipulate the quantum state. And at the end, uh, we need something to detect the quantum state. Actually, uh, uh, in these slides, you can see structures for all three components. For example, the middle one here, it's a very simple structure, just a ring cavity coupled with two bus waveguides. But it's probably the most efficient uh, parametric down conversion single photon source on, in the world right now. And also, we have developed uh, single photon detectors on chip. You can see this is the waveguide. We can have superconducting single photon detectors on, uh, on chip. And also, in this uh, slide, uh, actually, we, we can also do some photon conversion works, which will be the topic in the next few slides. And today, actually, I'll focus on the photon manipulation part. Basically, I'll talk about two experiments. The first one is based on optomechanics. I'll talk about our efforts in developing the first uh, quantum single photon frequency shifter. How do we manipulate the frequency of quantum state? And the second one is superconducting cavity electro-optics. This is actually one, uh, in this project, we want to solve the problem, uh, how to communicate, uh, how to connect two quantum computers. Right now, quantum computers, uh, one, uh, one very promising method is based on superconducting uh, uh, circuits. Basically, but the problem is that the frequency of that quantum computer needs to be, the frequency is around six gigahertz. That means you have to put the whole thing in very, very cold in, uh, environment, normally uh, tens of milli, uh, millikelvin. But in order to have quantum networks, of course, you cannot make the whole world at temperature at millikelvin, right? So we have to leave around 300 kelvin. That's why we need to convert that quantum information to optical frequency and then transmit. Basically, in the second project, we will discuss our uh, efforts in doing this. So let's talk about the first one, uh, the frequency conversion. The motivation for this project is actually, uh, it's very natural that in order to increase the, the capacity of a physical communication link, we can do uh, multiplexing. Uh, we can do uh, multiplexing, right? The first, uh, a very straightforward way is to do wavelengths or frequency dom uh, domain multiplexing. You need different wavelengths. But the problem is, no matter whether you are talking about uh, solid state uh, single photon emitters, for example, NV centers or quantum dots, or uh, the parametric down conversion uh, process, uh, their wavelength is kind of set. 
it's not like your laser. You can, you can have a tunable laser over a very wide range. But for quantum emitters, that's kind of difficult. So that's why, actually, we need, uh, our, uh, our idea is that we can have a single wavelength quantum emitter, but we can change that uh, single photon to, into different wavelengths afterwards. So that's the first reason. And the second reason is that there are a lot of quantum systems. For example, ions, items, we have experts here on this. And we have quantum dots and MV center atom, all kinds of quantum systems. And all of them are working with different wavelengths. In order to take advantage of different systems, we need to make them communicate with each other. That's why we need to control the frequency or wavelength of different uh, quantum systems. So originally, uh, they think uh, the frequency conversion of photons is done by classical nonlinear process. In this process, you have a very strong pump photons. And of course, first you have to have a nonlinear crystal with either chi 2 second order or chi 3 third order nonlinearity. In this case, we have a very strong pumps. And then uh, with your signal photon, if the phase meshing condition is, uh, is met, and this uh, original signal photon will be converted to another frequency. Uh, but there are some problems with this process. For example, uh, it needs a very strong optical pump. Why is that a problem? Because afterwards, you have to filter, uh, filter that out because most of the quantum technologies need single photon level sensitivity. So this pump is normally on the order of several milliwatts at least. So in order to filter out milliwatt photons to get single photon sensitivity, you at least need 100 dB filtering. And also, the strong optical pump will also generate some noise photons in the, during the process. For example, during, uh, because of fluorescence or Raman scattering, you can generate the noise photons that you don't want in the system. And also, because this process is actually power dependent, you cannot guarantee that you will always have 100% conversion efficiency. And also, because of the phase matching condition, it has a relatively small conversion window. So that's why we actually proposed this idea, the adiabatic process. Uh, in this process, imagine you have a photon in a waveguide or in a fiber. While the photon is still in the fiber, you very rapidly stretch that fiber. Physically, you are stretching the fiber, but actually the fiber is interacting with the photon. Equivalently, you are stretching the photon. By stretching the photon or compressing the photon, you can actually change the frequency of the photon. In this case, a mechanical pump uh, or your stretch is a mechanical pump uh, is used instead of optical pump. So there's no noise photons. And also, this is an adiabatic process. In principle, the conversion efficiency is always 100%. And also, there's no fit matching. Of course, the conversion window is very wide. In principle, it works for all wavelengths. But the problem of this uh, idea is how do we generate large enough amplitude with, fast, uh, with speed that is fast enough? Because in order to generate enough frequency shift, you need to stretch the fiber uh, long enough, fast enough. That's why actually we propose this idea. Let's look at the schematic first. So assume we have this released integrated waveguide made of aluminum nitride. And uh, it's, it is supported by several tiny pedestals. And we have two electrodes, the ground and the signal. Well, the photon is inside the waveguide. And we, and we drive the waveguide with these two electrodes very, very strongly through piezoelectric effect. Then equivalently, then if you look at this graph, uh, here we are looking at the cross section of the waveguide. With different deformation of the uh, waveguide, because we are driving it, we'll, it will oscillate, so it will deform. With different uh, deformation, the optical field will look different, actually. With different deformation, the optical field will look different. Actually, the effective refract index will be different, so the total optical length will be changed. So equivalently, we are stretching the photon. And actually, if you find this might be difficult to understand, actually this idea is very uh, similar to a 
trick in guitar. So if you uh, put your finger here on the second f uh, fret, and then you play the sixth string, and then you slide your finger to the seventh fret, you will hear that the sound pitch will increase, right? So basically, these two processes share the same uh, physical, uh, physics idea. It's just here, you have the sound frequency tuned by changing the length of the string. But in this case, we are changing the photon frequency by changing the optical length of the photon. So actually, uh, another advantage of this system is, uh, actually we can control the direction and amplitude of the uh, frequency shift very conveniently because the whole thing is controlled by microwave signals. And by change the microwave phase, we can uh, very conveniently change the, the frequency shift amplitude and direction. For example, if, you're, if our original photon enters the system at this time position, time point, and then you can see the phase, let's say this is zero phase, and then it actually will, uh, it will experience a blue shift and if the phase is changed by pi, then the original uh, photon will be red shifted instead of blue shifted. So with uh, uh, nonlinear optics, you have to change the, the pump. Uh, uh, you have to change uh, change the pump laser wavelength in order to achieve this uh, effect. But in our case, we can just simply change the phase of the microwave signal to achieve the same effect. Uh, this is the structure I, uh, the device I fabricated to demonstrate this. Uh, this meander shape here is the long released waveguide. Uh, the, uh, the yellow part are the uh, electrodes, and the photons are, couple, uh, are coupled in through this gritting coupler and coupled out through the other gritting coupler. So if you zoom in, you can see, uh, see it uh, more clearly. You can see this part is the release the waveguide that the photon will propagating uh, will propagate in this direction, and this part is the ground, and this part is the signal. And you may wonder because uh, in the schematic I show you that the whole structure needs to be released, right? But if it's released, how can I keep it on the substrate? Actually, uh, we played a small trick. Basically, after uh, 200 microns, we have this. Uh, tiny structure on the waveguide. And during the final wet releasing step, it, we can actually form a very, very, very small, very, very tiny pedestal here, just beneath this part. Everywhere else, the well, waveguide is released from substrate. That means the whole structure are just supported by tens of these uh, tiny pedestals under the waveguide. And actually, in this case, we achieve at first, we thought the mechanical performance might not be good. Actually, it's not bad. At resonant frequency, which is the thickness mode frequency, around 8.26 gigahertz, we have mechanical Q around 2,000. Actually, the best device we try to make is probably around 3,000. That's already very close to the empirical limit of the mechanical structure at room temperature. And with that, uh, we first characterize our device with single photons. The blue curve here is the uh, single photon spectrum without any frequency shifting. As you can see, after applying microwave power and change the phase from zero to pi, the single photon center frequency is changed from the blue side to the red side. And in this case, we can roughly tune, uh, tune the frequency around 2.5 nanometer. So, and actually, uh, another way to control the frequency shift amplitude is by applying different microwave power. So in this case, you can see uh, there is a, a square root dependence of uh, frequency shift on the power. The reason we have the square root uh, dependence is because frequency shift is proportional to the amplitude of the displacement, and uh, the displacement and amplitude is actually proportional to the square root of the microwave power. That's why we have this. 
And if you remember, actually at the very beginning, I told you that this process is adiabatic process. So in principle, we should have 100% conversion efficiency. So actually, with this uh, graph, we demonstrate that the process uh, does have 100% uh, quantum efficiency. As we increase the microwave power, so we should uh, experience a larger and larger frequency shift. But you can see the photon count doesn't change. And actually, the red line here uh, is the reference because we have some insertion loss in the system. But with the red line, we can calibrate that insertion loss. You can see all the data points fall within the error bar. So now, actually, everything is still in the classical domain. So we want to, uh, in order to use this device in the quantum domain, uh, very, very first step is to prove that we, uh, the photon is still quantum coherent after our process. So that's why, actually, we design a very, I'll say, very interesting experiment. So whole Mandel ex uh, experiment is a very, very famous experiment in quantum optics. So in this uh, Homo Mandel experiment, it's normally done in time domain. In this case, you have uh, uh, spontaneous, uh, uh, spontaneous parametric down conversion source, and you can generate two identical photons. And you send the two photons to two mirrors, one to the upper mirror, one to the lower mirror. And you do nothing to the lower mirror, it's just reflected. And then you tune the, the time delay of the upper mirror. And then you combine the two photons on a 50, 50 beam splitter. So when the, uh, and in this, in this case, actually we have four possibilities. So we have two photons and we have two outputs. So the first the possibility is that the lower photon is transmitted and the upper photon is reflected. And the second uh, possible uh, possibility is that both photons are reflected. And the third one will be both photons are transmitted. And the fourth one will be the upper, uh, the upper photon is transmitted and the lower photon is reflected. Right? There are four combinations, four possibilities. And then actually, if you do the math, you will find that the possibility, uh, the possibility to have the second and third, uh, uh, second and third situation, they are actually canceled. The only thing you can see is either the first or the fourth condition. So that means either the two photons going up this detector or going down detector. And that means if you measure the coincidence between the two detectors, you will see zero, right? Because the two detectors will never click at the same time. So this is the uh, traditional home manual experiment in time domain. But actually, we designed the home manual experiment in frequency domain. We still have the uh, parametric down conversion single photon source. But in this case, they are, non, uh, they are not degenerate. So we, uh, they are different in frequency. Let's say the blue photon with a larger frequency and the red photon with a lower frequency. We do nothing to the blue photon. And we send the red photon into our device. And we tune the frequency of that single photon. And after that, we send uh, uh, that photon back. Because we can tune the frequency, we can actually change this red photon into a blue photon. Then we combine the two photons at the 50, 50 beam speeder. And then if the photon is still coherent, uh, still identical to this one, we should expect that the uh, coincidence between the two uh, detectors will be zero. Uh, this is the experiment setup, how we do this. So we have the standard PPKTP type 2 uh, down conversion source, and we get the red photon, blue photon, and blue photon is just sent into an optical delay line to match the, the uh, time delay. And then we send the red photon into our device, device and the test. And then we do some frequency manipulation. And the red photon, we can uh, change that into a blue photon. And then we combine these two photons with a 50-50 beam splitter and detect uh, with uh, superconducting single photon detectors. Uh, this is the results we see. So 
we see three curves here. The black curve is that we do nothing on the device. Basically, you can see the uh, coincidence rate, relatively coincidence rate is around 50%. 50% is the boundary between classical world and quantum world. So we set it over there intentionally, actually. And if we shift our photon to the blue side, the red photon will be become a blue photon. So you can see the coincidence rate drops al almost to zero. This, ba uh, this basically proves that the process, after the process, the two photons are still coherent. They are still identical. And of course, if we shift the red photon further to the red side, uh, uh, to the red side, they will be uh, they will be more uh, they are more different. So that's why we see uh, uh, even smaller, uh, even higher coincidence rate. So actually, uh, if, uh, if you remember, I uh, the frequency shift, amplitude, and directions can be controlled by the microwave phase. That means. By, control, uh, by controlling the microwave phase of our device, we can actually change, uh, uh, change the visibility of this dip. The highest one is the blue one. The red one is this one. It's actually, we can continuously change how uh, similar the two photons are. Just now, actually, we use our device for frequency shifting. We are working in this regime they actually experience the maximum optical length change. Actually, we can work in a different, uh, uh, different condition. Basically, we call it time length condition. So let's assume, instead of uh, going into our device here, the photon, can also go, uh, the photon can also enter the device here. But if the photon leaves our device here, so on average, it doesn't experience any uh, uh, average optical length change. But actually, it will experience some chirping, some chirp, right? And actually, we found this is, uh, we didn't find this, but we realized this is actually very interesting because if you look at the equations for, uh, uh, for periaxial uh, diffraction and also for the propagating equation for narrow band dispersion, you will see that these two equations are very similar. On the left-hand side, we have the first-order derivative with respect to the distance. And on the left-hand side, we have the second-order derivative on the, uh, the cross-section, but here on the time. That means, for example, if we just look at the length, if we have a plane wave uh, incidence on a length with a focal length, then we can actually focus the plane wave into a very tiny spot. But in time domain, this means if we have a very, very long, very, very broad uh, optical pulse, we can actually focus, compress the pulse into a very, very short pulse. That's the effect called uh, time length effect. Uh, this is the device we fabricated in order to do this. So you can see there are many cascading units, right? Actually, each unit will be one device I introduced uh, uh, in the last section. Uh, in order to have a stronger effect, actually, we cascade uh, a lot of devices together to have a stronger effect. And also, we modified our waveguide design to have a more robust uh, structure. Actually, and also, you can see that there are one is released, the next one is not released, and also released, not released. This is because there is very strong face, uh, the face matching is kind of difficult to realize for optics and the acoustics. And we have to use quasi face matching condition to realize the equivalent face matching between acoustics and uh, optics. Uh, this is the experiment result. So with a CW light in, uh, into the system, we can actually drive the system, uh, drive our device with very strong microwave power. And with increased microwave power, you can see it actually works as a very, very strong modulator. St uh, and the strong, uh, the widest uh, modulation uh, we can get is around 1.15 terahertz. And if you do a simple calculation to fit the spectrum with uh, Bessel functions, 
you can actually see that our device has modulation depth around 21.6 pi. So if you want to realize the same modulation depth with commercial EOM or lithium nanobit modulator, you probably need several of them. And, and also, actually because there's no optical cavity involved, you can actually have, uh, you can actually have uh, input wavelength at, uh, in input laser at any wavelength. It should be working fine. After, uh, uh, after doing the basic uh, characterization of our device, then we can do the time length experiment. So this is a, a simplified setup for the experiment. We have a CW laser in. We have a EOM, a electro optical modulator. And with this device, we can generate a very uh, long optical pulse. The length is around 70 picoseconds. And with our device, we can uh, have a frequency chirp into the in the pulse. And so after our device, even though in the time domain, it's still 70 picoseconds, but you can see the phase of frequency inside the pulse will be different. After doing this portion compensation, we can actually compress the 70 picosecond pulse to 1.02 picosecond. So uh, this is the autocorrelation measurement of this pulse. It's around 1.4 picosecond. If we convert back, it's around 1.02 picosecond. And also, this is the data in the frequency domain. So uh, it's very similar to the previous one. We have around 1.15 terahertz, uh, 1.15 terahertz uh, width. So now uh, I finished the first part. As you can see, it's the traveling wave piezo optic mechanics. I introduced uh, two experiments. One is the single final frequency shifting. The other one is optical time lens. In the second part of the talk, I'll talk about our uh, work on superconducting cavity electro-optics. The reason uh, I want to do this is, uh, I've already talked about this at the beginning of the talk. So the reason is, uh, superconducting uh, quantum computers need to be in millikelvin because the uh, frequency is around six gigahertz. As soon as you bring that quantum state out in the room temperature, 300 Kelvin, the thermal noise will destroy the quantum state immediately. So that's why uh, right now uh, people are trying to think how can we connect two uh, quantum computers in uh, millikelvin temperature? How do we do that? So basically the idea will be how uh, to convert uh, 10 gigahertz or 6 gigahertz quantum state to optical frequency, for example, 200 terahertz, around 15, 15 nanometers. And at this frequency, the thermal noise of occupation is so low that the quantum uh, state coherence is actually can be conserved at room temperature, and we can send it with fiber or free space optics over long distance to really connect two quantum computers. Okay, you may think that we can do this for electro, uh, with electro-optical modulator. Basically, uh, from physics point of view, this device is just to convert microwave signals into optical signals, right? But the problem of this device, the efficiency is extremely low. The best uh, EOM you can buy is probably, commercial ones, is probably 10 to the minus six, but in the lab, people have demonstrated around 10 to the minus four. That means you probably need to wait years to have one byte transmitted. So we don't want that. So the idea is that we want to have a very, very efficiency microwave to optical converter. Ideally, we want efficiency approaching 100%. People have thinking about many different ways to do this. So with superconducting, this just uh, some comparison. Uh, so with superconducting uh, quantum qubits, uh, superconducting qubits, Actually, it can be made into a very good quantum processor for a quantum computer. But the problem, as I said, is gigahertz photons. So it has to be in a millikelvin temperature. But at optical frequency, it's actually very difficult to have single photon nonlinearity. That's why it's actually not very good for quantum computing, at least in a deterministic way. But it actually has very low thermal noise, and also the transmission loss is low. So it's actually you know, at optical domain, it's very good to have uh, photons to transmit quantum uh, information. 
That's why we need an interface in between to coherently convert quantum states between this frequency and this frequency. There are different ways to do it. People have proposed atom, rare earth ions, electron optical mechanics, piezo optical mechanics, magnons, electron optics, all different kinds of methods. Right now, the world record is, is done by a group at NIST or University of Colorado. They have demonstrated it, uh, they have demonstrated conversion efficiency around 8%. But the problem of their setup is they use a free space approach, fabric pro optical cavity with a microwave cavity in between and a mechanical membrane. And the mechanical membrane has relatively low frequency. That means the whole thing also needs to be at low temperature to prevent any thermal noise. And also the line width, the bandwidth will be small. It's around kilohertz. And also the intrinsic line width is actually only one hertz. Also, it will add a lot of vibration noise in it. So we decide we'll take another approach. We decide we take the direct electro optical conversion. So in around 2010, uh, one professor in Singapore proposed this idea. So we have a LC microwave resonator. And in the, uh, inside the capacitor, we have another fiber pro optical cavity with uh, EOM, uh, electro optical material inside. In this way, the uh, voltage across the capacitor from the microwave signal will modulate the uh, optical frequency. In this way, we can equivalently do microwave to optical conversion. So actually, this, uh, this is uh, the same as commercial EOM, but with the help of LC oscillator, LC, uh, with the LC resonator. And this is the interaction Hamiltonian. So you just need to see the G here. G is the interaction strength. If you remember from the second slide, I believe, I told you smaller will make this thing stronger, right? So as you can see here, we can make all three modes smaller to boost up the coupling strength to have a higher efficiency. But how do we do that? That's a problem, actually. But there are advantages uh, with this method. First, there's, it's very robust. There's no atoms or ions in, involved. Also, there's no mechanical part. So everything is uh, stable and robust. And also, there's no low frequency, uh, uh, low frequency resonance involved. So we have very, very large conversion bandwidth and low thermal noise and low amplification noise. In order to do this, we need to actually realize the, we need to solve several problems. One is the polarization match. The second one is phase match, and the last one is frequency match. So we need to find a way to engineer our device to uh, realize these three criteria at the same time. So actually, yes, uh, two years ago, uh, one group has already, uh, did, has already done some pre uh, work along this direction. But in their work, uh, both the theoretical and the experiment work, they match the free spectrum range of uh, optical cavity to the microwave frequency. Then you can have three resonance enhancement to boost up the efficiency. But the problem is still, in order to have match the 10 gigahertz, your uh, cavity radius is on the order of 2.3 millimeter. So that's why you have large modal volume, therefore small coupling strength, therefore low efficiency. That's not what we want. So actually, if you look at the if you look at the uh, matrix, electro optical matrix of aluminum nitride, you will find that before people always focus on 133 or one, uh, R13 or R33. But actually, if you take a closer look at R13, it's actually R113. What does it mean? It means we need two electric fields. Remember, there are three uh, uh, way, three modes involved: A, B, and C. Right? That means Two modes need to be have electric field along x direction. One mode need to have electric field along z direction. But actually, it's before people always think, okay, uh, the two optical modes they normally have the same electric field direction, but that's not necessarily the case. Actually, we can have optical fields with different directions, and in this case, z direction and x direction, and we can put the microwave 
uh, uh, electric field direction in x direction. From this uh, plot, you can tell the two optical modes, they are not from the same mode group. That means we do not need to match the uh, sp uh, free spectrum range. We do not need to match this to realize the three resonance enhancement. Basically, um, but there are also difficulties in, in realizing this because normally for face matching, this is a nonlinear process. We need to do face matching. But in a ring structure especially, in order to do face matching, it means the atmospheric number of the optical modes need to be the same, the M number. But with optical cavities, the M number is not at least hundreds, uh, can easily go up to 2,000. But even with mode, uh, M number difference of one, you screw up. There's, uh, there will be very low conversion efficiency. So we, we have to find a position for the two optical modes. They have the exact same atmospheric number out of thousands. So we actually find the experiment technique to do this. We find that when the two uh, M number, when they are the same, actually because of the non-perfect fabrication, because we will not have this vertical wall, we will actually have a wall with some angle. But this angle will lead to more splitting between the T and TM modes. So therefore, if we have a TM input, the output, if you don't have the face matching, we'll just observe a single series of modes. But with the full matching, uh, face matching, for example here, you'll actually see two sets of modes with strong signature of mode splitting. That's how we find the face matching condition. Actually, we don't know what M number it is, but we know at this position, the two M numbers, they are the same. So actually, with this technique, we can actually identify all the M number difference. The idea is very simple. We call it a uh, caliper uh, effect. For example, you have two rulers. In this case, TM, T, two sets of optical modes. Because they have slightly different uh, FSRs. So if we find this 0 and 0, they are matched. And if you plot the frequency difference between uh, the two ticks, it will first go up and then go down. Once it's, it's going down, we know okay, the M number difference will be 1 instead of 0. For example, these two ticks, 8 and 9, we know this M number is 1. And on the left, we know it's 0. So with this method, actually, we can identify almost all the M number difference. Here we know it's 1, here it's 2, here it's, two, uh, here it's 1, here it's 2. So actually, in the end, instead of working at this position, actually, we want to work at this position. M difference is 1. The reason is uh, the mode splitting at this position, M, uh, delta M is 0. It will cause uh, frequency splitting. And that frequency splitting is very large, normally on the order of hundreds of gigahertz, very easily. So actually, at this position, in principle, there should be no frequency splitting because we want to match the difference between these two modes to the microwave frequency, it's around 10 gigahertz. If you have the lowest, one, uh, lowest frequency you can reach here is hundreds of gigahertz. There's no way you can match that to 10 gigahertz. That's why we, in the end, we chose we work at this position. And now there's a problem. The face matching is not met because the M number difference is one. So we have to compensate this with microwave mode. So we designed this strange shape microwave mode, superconducting uh, microwave resonator. You can see the simplified circuit is like this. It will have symmetric and anti-symmetric modes. And anti-symmetric mode, it actually will have M number equals to one. So this works perfect for us to compensate the M number difference of between the optical modes. So that means with this condition, with this design, we can actually uh, realize the uh, face matching condition. So now it's time to uh, do the real experiment after so many design process. And this is a fabricated device. The blue part you see is aluminum nitride uh, circuits. This is a ring resonator. This is the bus, uh, bus coupling waveguide and the gritting couplers, two gritting couplers. Actually, the device gritting coupler should be here and here. And uh, there's another thing we need to take care. 
uh, is the frequency match because uh, this whole thing needs to be cooled because we are using superconducting uh, microwave resonators. So at low temperature, your resonance frequency, especially the optical ones, can shift uh, hundreds of gigahertz or even one terahertz very easily. So that means we have to find a way to tune the frequency at low temperature. But luckily, we find that the uh, two electro optical coefficients for aluminum nitride, one, uh, R13 and R33, they have opposite signs. One is plus, one is minus. That means if we apply a DC voltage on top of our device, the TE mode will shift to a shorter frequency, and TM mode will shift to longer frequency. So in this way, at low temperature, we just need to add a DC voltage to tune, to fine tune our, uh, our resonance frequency. And when it's around this position, the red line, the, uh, the frequency difference between the two modes is around 8.3 uh, gigahertz, which matches our microwave frequency. So now we have realized the polarization match, the phase match, and uh, the frequency match here. So we solved all the problems. And then we can do the experiment. The first experiment we want to do is still verify the coherence of the whole process. Even though in this experiment, we are still in the large amplitude coherence state. But uh, by observing the electro-optically induced transparency uh, uh, effect, we actually confirm that the phase, the coherence, is preserved during the whole process. This is because, okay, so this large uh, dip you see here is actually the optical resonance. And uh, this peak is because the optical, frequency, uh, the optical photon is first converted to microwave, then it will gain some phase and convert it back to the optical frequency and interfere with your original photon. Because there is a phase difference, you will experience a destructive interference. That's why you will see a little peak here. So as you can see, by uh, tuning the uh, by tuning the DC voltage, actually the resonance position will shift it, will be shifted, but the transparency window stays the same. This is the zoom in. So actually from this peak, the height of the transparency window, we can actually extract the internal conversion efficiency. Uh, the best we can get is around, uh, is around 26% internal conversion efficiency. So, but this is actually, uh, this, it's not a fair comparison between our number and the NIST number because we are calculating the uh, internal conversion efficiency. They are actually calculating the uh, system efficiency. Actually, we also, uh, uh, we also did some experiments to characterize the total efficiency. We followed their method by marrying the reflection from the optical port and reflection from the microwave port and also optical to microwave conversion and uh, microwave to optical conversion, we can actually extract that the system efficiency is around 2%. So even though it's still lower than their 8% total efficiency, but as you can see from these two uh, graphs, actually you can extract that our bandwidth is around 0.6 megahertz compared to their on the order of hertz, right? So it's much wider and also uh, based on calculation, we estimate that our noise is, around, uh, is below 10 to the minus 3. But in their case, it's normally around uh, 1,600. So in terms of noise and bandwidth performance, actually, we are, I think we are doing a better job. Um, actually, we still have room to improve the total conversion efficiency by using a material with larger nonlinearity, for example, lithium orbit, or actually solving the side wall angle problem, we can make the device even smaller to further boost the, the conversion efficiency. So actually, even though with the low efficiency, it's possible that we can do some uh, interesting experiment. Of course, the ideal case is if we have 100% uh, conversion efficiency, we can convert our 
uh, quantum state from superconducting qubit, microwave superconducting, uh, superconducting qubit, deterministically to optical frequency and send to another location, then convert it back. Equivalently, we are connecting two superconduct, uh, superconducting microwave systems. But even with relatively low efficiency, following the DLCG protocol, we can also realize some uh, uh, quantum communication between two quantum computers uh, probabilistically. By creating some, uh, by creating a correlated pair between microwave frequency and optical frequency, and also we do the same thing here, we send the optical photons uh, to the middle and do uh, uh, bare measurement. Based on the outcome of the measurement, we can actually erode some entanglement generation between the two superconducting systems. Equivalently, we can do some quantum computing. Right. So here I want to uh, make a summary of my talk. So I talk about two platforms. The first one is piezo optical mechanics. The second one is integrated superconducting cavities, uh, electro optics. And actually, we can do a lot of things based on this. We can make a lot of very, uh, a lot of devices with different functions and with very good performance, including mechanical resonator, optical resonator, microwave resonator, and single photon source, superconducting single photon detectors, everything on the same chip. And in this talk, I focus on two experiments, or three. The quantum single photon frequency shifting and optical time length. And the last one is the superconducting photonic circuits. So uh, now actually this slide is for my future plan here. So I'll focus on two directions. Actually, main focus will be on the first one. So we want to uh, build a hybrid quantum nanophotonic circuit. No matter it's for quantum communication or quantum sensing or quantum uh, uh, or CV quantum computing. So we want to generate quantum source, and we want to do phase modulation and phase tuning, and also passive circuits, and also detectors, everything on the same chip. But we are actually want to develop such a platform that can be applied for different quantum applications. And the second one is in the classical world, because as you can see from the frequency shifting experiment and the time lens experiment, our device can be used as a very, very good, very well good uh, modulator that is not only small, but also we can have very complex operation on the circuits. So actually, that's a very good platform for topological photonics, especially with some dynamic, uh, with dynamic modulation. We can do, for example, uh, we can do some optical arbitrary wave function generator for microwave signals those uh, kind of uh, uh, experiments in the classical world. So now I would like to thank my PhD advisor, Professor Hong Tang at Yale, and all the colleagues who work with me together, and also my collaborators. So now I'm ready to take questions. Thank you for your attention.